Hello, my name is Christian Bachem. I'm a research scientist at the Laboratory of Plant Breeding here at Wageningen University in Research. And I'm working within the HIP consortium, that is Holland Innovative Potato, uh, on a project that we call, that we've uh, uh, christened MAMI, and that is Markers and Models for Yield. Now, uh, in potato, yield is a big problem. Uh, it's been uh, attempted, of course, to improve yield over the years, but uh, we see that uh, older varieties that are up to 100 years old, such as Bintia or Russet Burbank, these are really old varieties, they have actually comparable yields to uh, the modern varieties. So despite their best efforts, breeders have not made a huge increase in those particular, in that particular key trait. Now, potato is, of course, uh, the most important non-grain food crop in the world and as such yield is really important to trait to try and look at. So we're looking at the genetics of that particular trait and also other traits um, and to try and get a handle on that we are trying to combine the, uh, the trait with the sequences of the genes that are responsible for making it. Now, potato itself is a, uh, a crop which was taken over by our Spanish cousins, uh, Portuguese cousins from South America uh, to Europe. Um, and in my way of thinking, they probably didn't take potatoes because they ate those potatoes on the way home. So what they did was to take a bag of seeds. And with that, took a whole pile of genetic diversity over to Europe. Now when they planted those seeds out and grew the potatoes, a lot of them didn't tuberize because normally potato grows in the equatorial Andes where it doesn't see that seasonal change in day length and it only makes tubers under short day conditions, relatively short day conditions of the 12 hour, 12 hour day, day, day night rhythm. So um, when potatoes came to Europe something had to change and what we've done is to make that uh, to map that change and look at how uh, the genes that influence the earliness uh, respond in European crops. Now instead of having uh, um, four copies of each chromosome in our commercial varieties, we call them tetraploid because they have four copies of each version. That means in a cross you have 16 possibilities, making genetics really complicated to follow. In this population that you see behind me, we've used diploids, which only have two versions, thus potentially only four copies from each of the parents. Uh, in each one of these, then two of those potential four copies. And because this is a partial back cross, uh, we only actually have three copies. Now, that makes genetics much simpler. Now, of course, we began by saying how important yield is, and uh, there are lots of components to yield, and this earliness trait, which, uh, uh, which is one of the, 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 the main factors also for yield, we have managed to map and locate in this population. And if you look across this population, you will see essentially three classes in height. So these very large plants are the late plants. They only tuberize around now. Uh, they begin to tuberize as the equinox, as the, the 12 hour day, 12 hour night uh, 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 comes into play. And so these start to tuberize. The smaller plants behind me have already been tuberizing for a long time. And if I was to open one up, you'd see little tubers at the base. Uh, because they're early plants. It turns out that the gene responsible for this trait, which must have come across with the conquistadors from South America, um, is the fact that a specific gene is broken. It's missing its back end, which is essentially the handbrake of the protein, which stops it from being produced at times of the day when it shouldn't be there. By breaking that back end, you're missing the handbrake and this thing is on all the time. And so the early plants are also producing tubers, what we call uh, constitutively, in other words, all the time. And we see this change in the phenotype from late plants, which 
are equivalent to those South American genotypes and these early plants which have enabled production in the northern latitudes during the long days of spring and summer when we want our potatoes to produce. So it's a really important gene and it's the knowledge about the biology will allow us to adapt and tailor our breeding to different geographic locations as I said. Now um, this gene is either broken or uh, complete and the different levels, the different numbers of these different variants uh, make intermediate phenotypes. In other words, you can have a bit early or a bit later. So it's actually a quantitative trait which in tetraploids can be these four, at least four different versions out of a selection of probably 20 that are out there in the germplasm. Um, now, um, looking at the flavor of that particular variant is really important and knowing more about these particular variants that occur in plants in diploids or in tetraploids is going to give us a feeling for whether a particular trait is associated with a particular, we call it allele or flavor of that particular gene at that particular locus. So the challenge is now not only to locate the presence of the gene but also to get a feeling for those different flavors of that particular gene on that particular locus spot on the chromosome. So that's a big challenge. Hi, I'm Natasha Van Leeshout, and I'm a PhD student at WIR, also working on the MAMI project. My side of things is on the computer side, which is commonly called bioinformatics. That means once everything has been grown in here, it gets chopped up into little bits, taken into the lab, sequenced, chopped up into more little bits, and then passed on to me to work in the computer. When it gets there, I have basically a lot of different little puzzle pieces. Where, and as we talked about how there's the four copies in the potato, it doesn't mean I just have a bunch of little pieces that I need to put into one sequence. I need to have a bunch of little puzzle pieces to put into four different sequences. And that's really complicated. Thankfully, nowadays, we have new methods and new statistical models we can apply to try and separate those bins out into the four. We also have a lot of historical data from many, many, many potato varieties with their whole genome sequenced. So taking that with the populations and the historical data we can have, we can say a lot more about what gene, what copies or what four copies of each gene are in each plant. We're working on automizing this tool so that you can just hopefully give the gene you want to look at, look at all, say which all the varieties you want to look at, and then get out which varieties have which copies of the gene and how many of them. So this tool allows us to visualize uh, not just on a marker level, but on actually the gene level, and then provide it in a way that's easy for even non-bioinformaticians to look at. This means that they can zoom right in and for each of the different copies for each of the varieties, see what the variation is and help use that to explain the variation in their plants and how they can use that in their breeding program. This whole tool, while it will be automated and super easy to use hopefully for breeders and researchers alike, it's still in the early phases and hopefully through my PhD we'll be able to refine how we take sequencing and use that and the bioinformatics sides to haplotype and then give that really nice specific information back to the breeders. And I hope that in a couple of years we'll be able to report all that success and maybe even that people will be using my program. <laughs> <laughs>